Hi, I'm super excited about this one. Check this out. You might have uh, seen this before in the background on my mailbag uh, video shelf. Intel delivers. Ta-da! What is it? It is the Intel MCS85 System Design Kit. It dates from 1976. Yes, that's only four years after man last set foot on the moon. Unbelievable. Now this is what you got if you wanted to play around with a processor back in the 1970s because it was a lot of work just to uh, blink a lead back then. Not as easy as it was these days, let alone do anything more complicated. So a development kit or system design kit as they uh, called it was a relatively simple way just to get up and running with, uh, in this case, Intel's latest microprocessors because otherwise it would have been like a real chore. This is allows you to play around with the processor and write programs for it and test them out and actually uh, connect up to hardware and things like that as we'll see. So a very nice bit of kit and yes it is actually a kit. It's look I got all the chips. I love the block diagram, the system bus. Oh, it's just beautiful. And all the miscellaneous uh, through hole, none of that surface mount rubbish parts. We even get the IC sockets. Wow. So these sorts of kits were pretty much the only game in town back then and because Intel wanted uh, to encourage people to buy their chips because that's when that was their business, they, they sold chips and that was basically it. Uh, they didn't really want to make money from these development kits so they sold these relatively uh, cheaply. I'm not sure they couldn't find the exact cost of this one so if anyone uh, knows the cost back in the day then please leave it in the comments down below. So there it is, the MCS85 System Design Kit, Intel 1976. So what do you get in the kit? Well, you're going to get the bare minimum to get a, a processor up and running. You're going to get the processor itself, the 8085A, for those playing along at home. Copyright Intel 76, fantastic. And of course, you need a monitor uh, ROM, slash BIOS, however you want to uh, think about it. We'll talk about these in a minute. And you need some RAM, so you need RAM, ROM, and of course, you need a uh, keyboard and display to interface with the thing. So this is both a combined keyboard uh, and display controller, the 8279. And you just get a couple of small uh, interface chips, a 74LS156 uh, decoder and an address decoder up there. And uh, the uh, seven segment uh, displays. We've got six of them here and the keys as well. There's the individual uh, key switches and a bunch of uh, passive parts and the sockets because, well, you know, you don't want to solder them directly directly into the board because you know, these, these processors might have been relatively expensive back then and the ROM and the RAM and you know meh. So who actually uh, bought these kits? Well, you might think, oh, people who are developing computers, but that's actually not really the case. The vast majority of customers for these kits would have been looking at using a processor to add intelligence, in quote marks, uh, to their new consumer product or their industrial uh, control product or something like that. So they needed a uh, processor to do that. So they would have bought this design kit to get them up and running. And hence why it's going to have a large prototyping area, as we'll see see when we take this puppy apart. Now, because this thing is mint in box, I'd probably get death threats. Not that I don't anyway, you know, YouTuber. But uh, yeah, uh, like if I tried to assemble this thing, yeah, the um, hate comments would flow. So, ta-da, here's one. I've assembled earlier. Well, I didn't assemble it. I managed to procure another one which was already assembled. Ah, this is a thing of beauty. Joy forever. Now, I think this one is a later model because, uh, look, it's different up the top here. Sister, this uh, system design kit is different and it's just got Intel up here. It doesn't have copyright 1976 anymore and some of the date codes on some of the chips, although these could have been added uh, later. We're talking about 1982. It's got the genuine Intel sticker on the uh, ROM there. This one does actually have a, a few additions that you didn't get in the standard uh, kit. The standard kit only had the uh, processor, the ROM, one RAM chip, and the uh, keyboard and display interface uh, driver kit chip. This one has got an additional RAM chip for a whopping 512 bytes total. 
That's bytes, none of that K rubbish. 2K of uh, ROM, which came standard in the kit, and all this extra stuff up here has been uh, added. This was uh, this is a bus expansion uh, driver section of the board, and you can see that whoever built this has obviously uh, populated that, but um, looks like they didn't do an awful lot with it because uh, they just developed programs because look at this large prototyping area they didn't interface with this at all they got some connector uh, ports here which you could have gone off uh, to your own products or you could use this large interface in area that got power strips uh, down the middle like this and that's very nice to be able to prototype your uh, industrial widget in mid to late 1970s this would have been absolutely fantastic and you could probably afford to use this section because I don't believe the development board was very expensive so uh, yeah if you needed another one or whatever you just buy another one and you build up more circuitry various uh, revisions of your hardware until you're perfected and then you design and lay out your own PCB and Bob's your uncle <laughs> you got your 8085 based product oh, look at the keypad down here speaking of which who designed this this is just absolutely ridiculous. Of course, I uh, got the uh, hexadecimal, of course, A, B, A through to F here. You've got six keys across here. Why not have A, B, C, D, E, F? That would have made more sense than have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 up here. That's not the usual arrangement. Like, that is just, why? Why would anyone do that? I don't know. Anyway, this one's had a little bit of an oopsie. It did come with this switch, but it uh, broke off and there's a trace um, just flapping around in the breeze there. So hopefully um, it still works, but I can fix that relatively easy. Anyway, this is to select between either uh, keyboard mode, either uh, keypad, keyboard mode, or uh, TTY, which is a uh, teletype interface. And there it is, the uh, TTY teletype interface, which goes off uh, to a D connector up here. And you could whack in a D connector. I don't think it, no, it doesn't come with one, but you could whack one in optionally. And that would go off at a whopping 110 board. 110 board. No, there's 300 board rubbish. And uh, yeah, you could hook that up to a, a serial terminal that were very common back in the 70s if you wanted to actually uh, like view information on, the, on a screen instead of the limited uh, six digit seven segment display here. So the TTY interface is basically just a serial port that you're familiar with uh, these days. The 110 board limit on this would have been uh, due to the 8085 on this. It wasn't the limit of the terminals at the time. The DEC VT50 and 52, that came out in 1974. So two years before the uh, 8080 processor here. So uh, that could go up to 9600 board. And then the VT100, uh, classic VT100 terminal came out, uh, which supported the ANSI standard which then uh, took off that came out in 1978 so two years after this but yeah they did have uh, terminals back then you'd have keyboard and display Whoa, 80 characters by 24 lines incredible Oh, I totally forgot to show you the documentation that came with this uh, assembled board, Intel Puerto Rico. I don't want my Puerto Rican viewers. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonder if their telex still works. <laughs> Dear SDK85 customer, Intel is pleased to provide you with the enclosed 8085 system design kit. We appreciate the opportunity to provide the equipment aid to aid in your understanding and evaluation of the 8085 microcomputer. As a supplier of high technology equipment, Intel is committed to providing design aids that will simplify your evaluation process and shorten your development cycle. Before proceeding further, please take a look at the following checklist. The Design Kit User's Guide has very complete step-by-step -step instructions. Follow them closely. Review the assembly language reference before attempting to write programs. Special note, please be advised that the Intel service hotline numbers on the top of the page in the System Design Kit are incorrect. The correct numbers are... There you go. Anyone want to call those numbers and see who answers? The 8085 is a very powerful yet easy to use microprocessor allowing you to pursue cost effective microcomputing. Intel is committed to making your 8085 experience both pleasurable and profitable. Ah, back when they used to provide schematics. Those were the days. Absolutely fantastic. Look at that. Ah, oh, just double sided. Ah. Oh. You can view that in glorious 4K. Who's responsible? And I wonder if they still work there. Hmm. And an overlay diagram. Oh, Bobby Desler. So before we power up this bad boy and see if it still works after almost 40 years, we'll get to that. Stick around. We 
you have to talk about the 8080 itself and the history, or at least I want to, because I'm a bit of a computer history buff. So this bad boy here, the 8085, released in March 1976 and only discontinued in 2000. So absolutely remarkable to get like 24 years out of a like a single micro that you can continue to buy. Absolutely incredible. Do modern ones, uh, do they have production times of 24 years? Unbelievable. <laughs> Leave it in the comments. Anyway, it's an 8-bit processor, hence the name 8085, but we'll get into the history of why it's named that. Uh, it's uh, clock speed 3 up to a blistering 6 megahertz, and that was really quick for the day. Um, it uses 16-bit address bus, uh, has 6,500 transistors in it on a 3-micron process, so... <laughs> Like 6,500 transistors these days is like, it, it's nothing. That's head of a pin stuff. But hey, back then, you know, like doubling the number of uh, transistors on the silicon Moore's Law and all that sort of stuff, um, it was, yeah, it was ramping up. Anyway, let's go back to the, almost the beginning of 1970 when Intel, of course, released the classic 4004 for use in uh, calculators and... Uh, <laughs> primarily for calculators back then, but also used in industrial applications too. And then in 1972, a year later, they released the 8008, which is an 8-bit uh, version of that. And they also released the 4040, but nobody really cared about that in 1974. What we care about in 1974 is that they actually released the 8080 processor. And of course, the 8080 is the classic chip that was used in uh, arguably one of the first uh, you know, consumer hobbyists uh, uh, personal computers available, which was the Altair 8800, but that didn't come around until January 1975. So it was, you know, the chip had been out for like a year before the Altair actually got around to using it, and it was uh, famously published um, in January, and then Bill Gates saw it, and well, you know, it started the Microsoft thing. But in 1974, Intel weren't the only uh, show in town. You had the Motorola 6800 as well, uh, which came out in the same year. And that one actually used a, it was really good because it used a single 5 volt uh, power supply. You've got to remember, the 8080 didn't actually use a 5 volt supply. It required three rails, uh, plus 5 volts, minus 5 volts, and plus 12 volts. So, you know, that really was a pain in the ass and not hugely compatible with, you know, all this 5 volt uh, TTL type stuff coming on the market. So, yeah, that's where the 6800 kind of had an edge at that stage. But also in 1974, if you didn't want to use a uh, microprocessor like this, which required external ROM, external RAM, and, you know, stuff, it was a multi-chip uh, solution, hence the name processor. It was just a processor. If you wanted what's now known as a microcontroller, the first microcontroller came out in 1974 as well. I've done a video on this. Uh, the old Merlin game used to use it. It was the uh, Texas Instruments TMS-1000. The Merlin used uh, the TMS-11. But anyway, the TMS-1000, the world's first microcontroller, came out in 1974 as well. So if you wanted uh, to develop a little smart sort of widget back then, and you could fit in the cons tiny constraints of the microcontroller, then the TMS-1000 uh, was a neat solution, and it was only a couple of bucks a pop. And, you know, so that was quite nice. But if you wanted any decent sort of uh, processing capability, you had to go for a microprocessor like either the 60 8800 or the 8080 and have external memory and ROM and the whole works. But generally back then, people weren't making small stuff. You know, as I said, make, still making big like industrial controllers and other sorts of stuff where, you know, you needed the extra processing power of this. So that was pretty much the only game in town until 1975 when the classic 6502 came out and that was a low-cost 5-volt uh, CPU. But it really wasn't used in anything in 1975. It was out, but it wouldn't be a year later until 1976 when the Apple One started to use and other computers started to use the 6502, especially in 1977 with the PET and the Apple II and the Atari 2600 and all those sort of ones. 1977 is when sort of things started to take off, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So even though we had the 6502 in 1975, 
yeah, there were no like mainstream computers around using the thing. I'm not sure if you were around back in the day, were you using 6502 in any like industrial applications or uh, uh, something like that? Anyway, in 1975, Intel realized, yeah, we have to come up with, you know, this single five volt thing seems to be a hit. Have to come up with a single five volt uh, controller. So uh, what do you call it? Well, the other one was the 8080. We'll call this the 8085. The five means five volts only. And they finally released the 8085 in March 1976. But also famously in March 1976, a, another company called Zilog were working on the Z80. They started that in uh, 75 as well. And they came out with uh, the Z80 in the same month as the 8085 came out. And unfortunately for the poor old 8085, the Z80 was just a better solution for all sorts of various uh, reasons. It was like multiple manufacturers could sell it and things like that. So the Z80 really took off as the processor of uh, choice for various personal computers from then on. The 8080, I don't know, try and name computers that used the 8085. You have to sort of go to 1983 with the Tandy TRS-80 or Trash-80 Model 100, which used a uh, CMOS version of the 8085, the 80C85. And Zilog didn't come out with a CMOS version of their process, Z80 processor until uh, well after that. So, but you know, pretty much, I don't know, the Model 100's probably it for the, eight, famously for the 8080, but that was used well into uh, the 1983, well through uh, probably most of the 1980s still in the Model 100. But all the Motorola fanboys, Dave, what about the 6809? Um, yeah, sorry, that didn't come out until 1978. So, you know, it's, you know it was used in quite a few um, PCs on the market and things like that. But yeah, Intel with their 8085 pretty much uh, ruled sort of like the embedded uh, market. I, I don't know why, because they had better tools. People were familiar with it, with the uh, from the 4004, the 8008, the 4040, the 8080. They were just, you know, so they just took up uh, the 8085. It was pretty much like the embedded uh, processor of choice back then. So hey, what's your favourite processor of the 1970s? Is it the 8080, the 8085, the Z80, 6502, 6809, 6800? Let us know in the comments down below. Flame away. Anyway, our old friend here, the 8080, that was uh, superseded by the 8086. And then, of course, they did the lower priced or uh, easier to interface lower cost solution that was of course the 8088 which was used in which had an external 8-bit uh, architecture and could use all the 8-bit chips um, hence the uh, name 8088 as opposed to 8086 was a 16-bit architecture anyway that was famously used in the uh, original IBM PC and well the rest is history but as was common uh, back in the day, the 8085 and all, all the other uh, processors from Motorola and uh, the, you know, Zilog and others, they also came with uh, like many different support chips to build entire systems. The 8080, here's a list of like, I think it's about three dozen or so different uh, companion chips that help you build up the, you know, any sort of industrial or embedded uh, or PC, you know, consumer device uh, computer that you could possibly imagine. They had GPIB controllers and serial ports and all sorts of, uh, you know, really whiz-bang uh, accessory chips for this thing to build up complete systems. All right, enough of the history lesson. Let's power this thing on and see if it still works all these years later. Now, the manual uh, says uh, 1.3 amps uh, nominal supply. That seems a bit high to me. Um, so anyway, I've set my current limit to 1.3. If you're powering up like old stuff like this and you you want to be cautious, um, I probably would have like set like 500 milliamps or something like that. And you're not really going to damage it if you set too low a current limit. It the voltage is just going to drop and it's just uh, not going to work uh, basically so um, yeah better safe than sorry so you definitely don't want to go over the rated uh, limit and uh, looks like the previous owner had these wires in here already so it looks like that's how they uh, powered the thing up looks like there's one uh, tantalum in there so apart from that I think all the rest of them are ceramics so there's nothing really 
that uh, should have gone wrong with this. So unless there was um, some other fault, I, I kind of expect this to work. Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. And we don't need the uh, minus 10 volt rail there. That's only for the uh, teletype interface, which uh, I'm not going to use. All right, I've definitely got the polarity around the right way. Let's power it on and... Ta-da! Hey! 80, 85! Winner, winner! Chicken dinner! Geez, that's not very bright. Um, <laughs> but yeah, old school displays. Genuine HPs for those playing along at home. And that's drawing just over an amp there, so no worries. So 5 watts, uh, nominal, but as I said, this actually has uh, some extra uh, port expansion here and a whopping extra 256 bytes of RAM. Now, these uh, chips, by the way, these RAM and ROM chips, these are very interesting. These aren't just RAM and ROM. They actually contain uh, data latches as well in them. So that's rather interesting. That was just part of the um, 8085 uh, system. So yeah you couldn't you couldn't just I don't believe you can just replace this like with any old ROM you've got to actually use the genuine Intel ROM or compatible if there were any I don't know now speaking of the uh, ROM what we've got this is called a monitor ROM and it's kind of sort of different to a BIOS. A BIOS does more stuff like BIOS on a modern computer. A monitor ROM is just designed to have a simplistic uh, keyboard and display uh, interface so that you can just interact and monitor all of the addresses, hence why it was called monitor ROM. So you can, it's basically like just a, like a peek and pokey uh, type of thing for you peek and poke fanboys. But anyway, reset, it displays 8085. I assume the dash is uh, correct there. And it's got a dedicated uh, vector interrupter button. That's nice. We'll actually use that in a minute. Oh, the board's a bit how you doing. Let me prop it up. I assume this is 100% working. So we should just be able to jump into a memory uh, address and actually enter code that way. So uh, sub ST is uh, substitute memory or type in the memory address. Now, 2000 is uh, the memory address. Here's the memory map over here. Uh, 2000 is where the RAM actually uh, started. So we go 2000 and we go next and F7 is the current data in there, but we can overwrite that with, you know, AA, something like that. And we can just go next and it'll increment to the next memory address. And that's what's there. And we're basically just overriding um, what's in memory there. And if we want to execute the program we just ended at uh, the address 2000, we just go go 2000 like that and execute. And well, it's it does nothing because we typed in random stuff. But let's actually program in a program. Let's see if we can get this sucker to count. Right, so let's reset. Substitute memory 2000 next 31. Hey, hey, 3D. Now here's where we want to jump to another address, 20D4, so substitute memory, and enter FB, D5 is 76, and C9. And that is our program. Woohoo! Okay, so we'll just go back, hit reset here. That won't erase our program. It doesn't actually reset the memory. It just uh, resets the uh, processor. Um, it, yes, this is RAM, so it's volatile. So if you remove the power, you will lose your program. Ah, uh, well, none of that uh, Flash or even E squared prom rubbish back then. So yeah, we can reset that. And uh, to run the program, we want to go go. 2000 and fingers crossed execute Ta -da! <laughs> counting and we should be able to uh, vector interrupt that to stop it yes vector interrupt was supposed to stop it um it was supposed to be able to resume hmm now we can actually change the speed of this thing uh, with uh, by changing the value in address 2010 so we go substitute memory 2010 like that and Next, and it's currently got 18. Uh, I'm not sure if it's faster or slower. So let's just go 10, shall we? 
So, next, go, 2000, execute. There you go, is that faster? Yep. And if we put the value of one in there, it should be really quick. Go, 2000, execute. Wow. Oh, blinding speed. We can mine some Bitcoin on this sucker. So what speed is this bad boy running at? Well, it's got a 6.14 meg uh, clock, which is actually uh, divided by two internally, uh, which gives a, an actual uh, clock speed of uh, 3.072 megahertz. But the processor um, can't do single cycle in, well, <laughs> instruction cycles vary anywhere from like one to five clocks, I believe. So depending on what uh, it's actually doing. So yeah, not single cycle instruction stuff. So you're not gonna get 3.072 2 million instructions per second or MIPS. <laughs> it's not going to happen, but you know, it's pretty good for the day. It's 1976. And if we probe the clock pin, pin 37, ta-da, there it is, 3.072 megahertz. So um, the neat thing about the 8085 is that uh, it did have a clock out pin that, that then you could use, you could, uh, like it had an internal oscillator for starters, and then it divided that by two, and then you could use that clock pin to uh, drive other synchronous uh, external stuff in your system. Neat. Well, it was neat for 1976. So there you have it. That's the Intel MCS85 system design kit from 1976. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. And of course it still works. I, you know, there was never any doubt, really. I mean, these chips are just so robust, like uh, multi-micron uh, process technology. They're just, you know, not these newfangled things. But anyway, you take for granted, uh, like, uh, just buying a microcontroller kit these days for like a couple of bucks delivered, and all the software it's free and everything else and there's tons of uh, tutorials and it's all flash program memory and you know nothing like this uh, old school microprocessor uh, where you had to store it in volatile RAM I guess there uh, you could actually have a battery back you could hack in a battery backup uh, to this if you were uh, desperate I guess to keep your program in there but every time you wanted to uh, test out your program you had to enter it and if some you know dickhead manager came along and accidentally bumped the power or something like that uh, you could lose a day's work just programming this thing so there might have been like uh, external storage solutions I'm not sure but anyway yeah you just enter it in um, on the keypad it's actually pretty quick once you've actually got your list in to actually you know enter it in just bam 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 you know automatically increments to the next address and you know you just type in the numbers and and that's it um, but uh, yeah if you make a single mistake <laughs> you come a gutsa and your program doesn't work or it's you know buggy so you just have to go through and check each address uh, and of course it comes with a full human debugger uh, you can go in there and single step and uh, check individual memory addresses and stuff like that and well that's what you have to do but anyway um yeah uh, to develop programs for this you would use the intel intellic uh system pretty much there might have been other uh systems available at the time to actually uh, you know assemble your program and things like that but uh yeah, this is how it was done. Uh, and then you program a mask ROM that we've got here. Huh, when was the first EEPROM? Anyway, certainly weren't electrically erasable. You know, get your UV light out. Thank you very much. Leave it in the comments if you actually uh, had one of these and you played around with it. This is unfortunately uh, before my time, but I can still certainly uh, appreciate this. It's awesome. And I mean, just imagine this back in the day. This would have been like absolutely phenomenal. And please, if you know how much this thing cost, I believe it was actually pretty cheap. So um, like, because Intel just wanted to get you into doing this and I believe like just reg regular Joe Average could just uh, buy this uh, from Intel and you could uh, develop your processes back then so yeah fantastic so also leave it in the comments if you know what the equivalent systems were for like the 6502 and the 6800, the 6809 and things like that, uh, the Z80. Um, did they have like equivalent things? I mean, the Intel was it pretty much became the de facto uh, standard for like embedded uh, products and things like that because uh, maybe because of their um, support and their intellic uh, design uh, programming system and things like that perhaps so anyway I hope you enjoyed that if you did please give it a big thumbs up and as always discuss down below in over in the comments and check out my library channel I'm like 24,000 uh, subscribers over on the library channel still going gangbusters fantastic 
Catch you next time. Yeah.